Welcome, everybody, to the Valor Podcast. It is a great pleasure to be able to welcome Jeremy Allaire. Uh, he is a stranger to none of us in the crypto space. Um, what's less known is the fact that he's been an executive and inter internet entrepreneur for a couple of decades on, on some uh, global technology platforms. Most recently, obviously, in his current role, is the CEO and chairman of uh, Circle. Uh, which is a, well, actually, we'll get into exactly what that is. Jeremy, I'll, I'll have some questions for you about that. But uh, very welcome, Jeremy. We have only about a half an hour together, so we're going to make it quick and sweet, but very welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. My pleasure. To start off with, um, let's talk directly about what Circle is. Is it is it fair to say, obviously, you have USDC, which is a stable coin. And is it fair to say that your main business model is really to take in USD, issue tokens on a blockchain, invest the proceeds of those USDs in treasuries, etc., and earn the yield from that? Or is that just too simplistic? It's definitely too simplistic. Um, you know, uh, a few things. So f first is, um, you know, we think about what we operate as a stablecoin network and the, the stablecoin network has a few different pieces to it. Um, one piece is the blockchain infrastructure that we build. So the protocols, which are the actual stablecoin protocols, we're now in mul multiple iterations of those the cross-chain transfer protocol that we build, other public blockchain infrastructure like Paymasters and other things that we're supporting to make it very easy for both end users and developers to build on this. So as a network utility, we again, the kind of conceptual model here is we operate an internet scale utility and an internet scale network utility that allows anyone in the world to build on it, use it and access it. And like a lot of other internet utilities, um, it has kind of network effects. The more developers that build apps that integrate with it, the more utility that the network brings. The more users that have apps that use it and have the, the actual digital currency, the more network utility that it brings. So it's a kind of platform-based business model that is really anchored on developers building on it and integrating to it. Um, and so that's one central tenant of it. The second is, is there's a liquidity network, which is a really key part of this, which is essentially the asset itself, ensuring that the digital dollars and the digital euros that, that we issue are the most liquid, most available in the world. And so we have an enormous undertaking as a firm in many ge uh, uh, jurisdictions around the world to ensure that um, institutions, wholesale market participants, and then the whole liquidity ecosystem, which ranges from fintechs and payments firms to OTC firms, market makers, exchanges, on and off ramp providers, like an incredible array that all of those firms have what I like to call digital dollar dial tone. They have the ability to create, redeem, access, and make liquid and available those digital assets. So there's a liquidity network piece of this, which is a huge part of what we do. And that, that extends out into all of the regulatory licenses that we have, the international operations that we stand up, the global banking partnerships that we build, et cetera, uh, to do that. And then the third piece is actually our full, our full on developer platforms. So um, in order to accelerate the adoption of our stablecoin network and to enable more enterprises, startups, and developers to build apps that connect to blockchains, we, uh, we offer this collection of, of crypto infrastructure as a service, programmable wallets, smart contract platforms, Circle Gas Station, and these are developer platforms to allow people to build on-chain applications more easily. And so all that kind of works together. Um, and that really is, is Circle's business. Um, today, yes, we monetize through uh, uh, reserve income, uh, but we're building up uh, uh, additional streams of monetization as well through some of these technology services and infrastructure services that, uh, that we're operating as well. Awesome. At Valor, we're, we're one of your proud partners. So, Absolutely. Uh, you know, part of the exchange liquidity network, we're obviously the largest player in Africa kind of bringing liquidity to the USDC ecosystem. And I think we, we, we mint a tremendous amount every week with you yeah, guys. It's, so it's, am it's amazing to have the partnership. Absolutely. 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 The, the total stable coin market right now is north of 150 billion us dollars, which is huge. Yeah. Um, 
I wanted to hear a little bit about you from you about what is the ultimate goal? Like, okay, you just explained the three different pillars right now where Circle is, but in a sentence or two, what is your vision? What are we building towards? What would you be proud of as the ultimate vision and goal for Circle as a company? Yeah. So a couple things. I think, um, you know, when, when we set out to build this 11 years ago, we had some high level ideas. We believe that it would become possible to build a protocol for dollars on the internet, that that protocol would be on public blockchain infrastructure, that that would be legal, kind of a legal form of, of digital currency money. Uh, and that, um, and that the advent of kind of virtual machines that run on these networks would allow for programmability of money. And that over that, over some time, and we thought it would probably take about 10 years, over around 10 years, you'd get to a point where all that would be there. And that essentially like the marginal cost of storing and moving value, like digital dollar value or digital euro value, the, the marginal cost of storing moving value would approach zero. And so we've actually, that's basically where we've gotten today. Like we've gotten to a point where, you know, uh, layer twos and high performance layer ones, the UX abstractions, we have legal status for stable coins increasingly around the world. Um, and, and this is sort of accessible and usable. We've gotten to that point where you can actually transact for, for, for nearly free and you can kind of store and move that value very inexpensively. And you now have the ability to intermediate it with smart contracts. Huge progress. That was the founding vision. We're sort of realizing what I call the 1.0 right now. And so to your question, um, it's sort of where, where are we going, right? I think from my perspective, you know, we're in the very early stages of, of this market's development, very early stages. And, um, you know, I, I, people ask me, like, where are we relative to past a kind of tech, technology epics, right? I kind of think we're in like the 2003 of, uh, of, of the adoption of this technology. Um, and in 2003, if you were around, right, the internet was there. Um, it wasn't highly usable. It had, you know, people were using email. They were doing some things like search, but like the broader adoption and like the huge breakout in terms of like high, high utility for society, it really happened in the decades that followed. And, um, and so I, th I think we're roughly there, but how does that translate in terms of, you know, kind of concretely? Um, today, there is around $100 trillion of legal electronic money in circulation in the world that covers all countries, all currencies, uh, commercial bank intermediated money, as well as like money market money. And so that's a big total addressable market. So that's like the, the stored value kind of, kind of market that exists there. And then adjacent to that, you have enormous markets, trillions of dollars in scale that include the utility of money. Um, the ability to, to transact and collect payments for it, whether business to business or consumer, the use of that money as a settlement medium in capital markets is another huge utility of that money. These are enormous utilities. And so I guess my view, my high level view is that um, open internet software, open networks, open protocols um, have kind of um, consumed more and more of the utilities of many industries in the past information, media, software, content, communications, uh, et cetera, retail. Um, but the, the open internet has not really kind of consumed and provided the substitute utilities in the financial sector. I believe it will. And so I believe there's an opportunity to grow from where we are today, like you said, 150 billion stablecoin in circulation into the trillions over time. But more importantly, that the application utility of that money will be a completely new level of utility that we haven't had before. Programmable, composable money is a breakthrough that the world has not had access to. And I ultimately believe that the velocity of money on these networks and therefore the amount of transactions that happen in the world will, will, will potentially go exponential. And so just the, the net world output of transactions will grow as a result of, of this technology. Absolutely. One of the things I think a lot about uh, in the history of money is how we've kind of gone from commodity money where people had gold, as an example, to representative money where they had depository receipts on the gold. That was a technology that allowed people not to carry these heavy you know, lumps of metal everywhere. And then went into fiat money, which is where the paper money got divorced from the actual commodity money and was obviously managed by a central bank. But now we're seeing like the next step, which is the issuance of these tokens backed by the you know fiat money that's mm -hmm. obviously managed by the, the central bank. 
And so one starts wondering, okay, is there going to come a time where you have these these tokens that the fiat actually starts disappearing and now you just got the tokens but then that starts begging the question about cbdc's and their role in the economy and and the federal reserve is an example i know the fed has talked about cbdc's central bank digital currencies for those that are listening um but they were not too close i understand that but do you view like a how do you view CBDCs and B is that a threat to your business and what does the future hold when it comes to CBDCs and stablecoins? Yeah, so in the United States, there's no effort to build central bank digital currency. Public is opposed. Congress is opposed. Um, it's just not on. It's not a. It's not a thing that's that's happening. Um, and so you know, I guess I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it because it's just not a thing that's happening. What I am focused on is ensuring that we have clear laws around um, stablecoin money, um, as we now do in Japan, as we now do in the entire European Union. USDC is the first and only legal digital dollar under European stablecoin laws, uh, uh, global digital dollar, uh, which is incredible. Um, but in, in the United States, um, and as well as globally, right, the, the there's this innovation that's happening, which is, public internet infrastructure, public blockchain infrastructure, and the innovation that that presents is just an incredible area for creativity and, 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 and activations. And so we're just focused on what's in front of us and, and building that and, and, and building that in a, in a highly sustainable way. I think the good news is that the Federal Reserve has had a major role in sort of thinking through how to regulate and supervise private sector digital dollars in the form of stable coins. And so the priority in the United States, just as the priority in Europe, is to build the rules of the road so that the private sector can issue these digital currencies in a, in a safe, transparent, well-regulated manner and let the private sector innovate and drive this and let the private sector take advantage of this technology and continually improve this technology. That's the priority of almost every government in the world. Uh, and so I'm just sort of focused where, where are the government's priorities and then where's the market and where's the market opportunity. And I think we're very well aligned with those things. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, something that came to mind as you're talking right now, a few people are aware that the current Federal Reserve is actually not the first Federal Reserve in the United States. It's actually the third. And the first two versions of it had lifespans of only 20 years each. Following which, and in between, you know, central banks and other private institutions issued their own currency. So think about the situation <laughs> where Circle is an issuer of money, private money that isn't backed by a central bank. Obviously, this is now talking, you know, many many years ahead potentially. Uh, but it's interesting to see what all the different permutations that could result from the changing scope of money in society. Yeah, I mean, one one can speculate over a, a, a very long term. Uh, 20, 30 year time frame as to like what the competition in, in currency will be and sort of the technology basis for that as well as the economic basis for that. Lots of lots of possibilities in the long term future. Obviously, r right now, the important thing is is people want a digital dollar that is a very clear store of value that is backed by uh, government obligation money that is, you know, held to the highest standards of of audit to of of compliance of risk management and you know that's that's what people want um and and uh and so uh, you know sort of trying to think too too far uh, outside of that uh uh you know is uh probably dangerous understood understood um want to hear your thoughts you talked about kind of the the here and now um obviously we've got a u.s presidential election that's coming up and there are different, you know, there has been a current crypto policy that's been in place with the current administration, uh, with the two presidential candidates right now, which seems like a tight race. Wanted to get your thoughts about the implications of this presidential race on the crypto market and particularly stable coins and how you see this from 2025 onwards. Yeah. So I think the interesting thing is, um, you know, if, if you if you're up close and looking at the policy environment in the U.S. around crypto, you know, as we went into the the spring and the summer, huge amounts of work were happening on a bipartisan basis. Republicans, Democrats, Senate, House, you know, and then even, you know, key agencies, the White House, the Treasury Department, the Federal Reserve, others, a lot of stakeholders wanting to get 
policies uh, through Congress. And so a lot of the work's been done. A lot of the work for sound, fair policy that will work in terms of keeping jobs, keeping companies in the United States, creating clear rules of the road, uh, establishing strong protections for markets, consumers, uh, you know, end users, et cetera. So a lot of that work's been done, very bipartisan. And I think we're very close to those coming into law. So I think no matter which of these candidates is in the Oval Office, there will be bills reaching their desk. Those bills will reach their desk, both for crypto markets and stable coins. And we'll have laws uh, that are bipartisan in nature that advance this in the United States. And I think you have you know, commentary out of each campaign about some of this. Um, and, uh, and you know, you know, one campaign is sort of marketing itself as super crypto friendly. I think the other is basically marketing themselves as we're going to be pro entrepreneur, pro builders, pro American companies, pro entrepreneurship, and we'll, we want fair, safe regulation. Uh, but like, you know, sort of not just to crypto, but with more broadly to startups and entrepreneurs and builders and technology, a sort of constructive tone. And so, um, you know, I think leaders are spending more time with these campaigns, but at the end of the day, you know, it's Congress's job to write the laws and the work, a lot of the work's been done. And I think there's a real desire to, uh, to, to sort of see this come to pass in short order. So I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm optimistic about where we are. We have the most educated political, um, you know, the, 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 policymakers and politicians are, are more educated on this than they've ever been. And people acknowledge that the stakes are high, that this is a, a, a major industry. It's not going away. And, uh, and I, I think that bodes well. So fair to say that you're not too concerned about the outcome of the elections for the, for the future of your business? For stable coins, I think we're going to we're going to see a fairly consistent view uh, 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 across across the board. Got you. All right. Over the last few years, and one of the things that we've also seen on at Valor on the exchange is that uh, you know just talking to our customers and our market makers and our clients is that there's been quite an aggressive stance from the SEC, obviously, on crypto companies in general within the mm -hmm. United States. So I'd say over the last 18 months or so, we've started to see quite a big shift of investments, uh, trading volume, a whole bunch of stuff from kind of the West to the East, mm -hmm. right? Is that something that you're also seeing when it comes to minting and like your, your, your uh, customer base? Are you seeing that shift from the West to the East? And, and I'm kind of saying... Forget about what you want to see, but the facts on the ground, what are you kind of seeing that shift from where the crypto markets are taking off given regulatory clarity or lack thereof? Yeah, I mean, look, um, digital asset markets um, and products and services have always been highly global. The majority of those, both markets and product adoption has always been greater outside the US. Um, and that continues to be the case. Um, that has been the case for USDC for a long time. Um, the significant majority of the adoption of USDC is is international, non-US, um, and and we're investing and expanding all around the world um, because there's demand all around the world for digital dollars like USDC uh, within fintech products uh, around the world. Um, and so, you know, uh, while having clear regulation around the issuance of USDC as a digital dollar in the United States would be valuable on a global level. Um, uh, and so it is important, actually, the stronger the, the kind of regulatory framework in the U.S. for something like USDC, the more valuable we think it is around the world and the more counterparties around the world are going to want to depend on this. And, um, and so th there is a connection there. Um, but just overall, in terms of like market behavior and 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 where we see activity and growth, very very international, uh, right. yeah. And as far as your product pipeline, you've obviously got USDC, you have got EURC. Are you planning on issuing other, any other stable coins in any particular jurisdictions that you find promising? Yeah. So right now, I think USDC and EURC are both very strong products and we're really focused on growing those. We expect that you know, digital dollars are gonna be the preferred currency of the internet, um, uh, more so than any, any other. 
Uh, and, and so that's a huge market opportunity. Um, as clear regulatory frameworks come into place in large jurisdictions for stable coins for general use, like in Europe through Mika, we do believe that there are kind of domestic opportunities, uh, meaning like the benefits of, of Euro stablecoin can play out in commerce and finance and other on-chain activity in Europe. And so Europe is an enormous market, the GDP, the size of the market, total population. And, and, uh, and so we see, you know, really good growth opportunity there. Um, but I think, you know, as a stablecoin network, we want to see other stablecoins in other jurisdictions and other currencies. It's, it's very important that they are there. And what we're seeing is regulators, whether it's in UAE or Singapore or Hong Kong or Japan or the UK and, and increasingly other jurisdictions are putting in place stablecoin regulations. And that's great. And I think what that will mean is that there will be more issuers in more currencies with high quality regulation around them. And that can help proliferate the entire demand for stablecoin activity on chain. And that can help grow the benefits of a stablecoin network like what Circle's building. And so um, we definitely see opportunities with the technology infrastructure that we're building to, uh, to see those companies that are issuing uh, other currency stable coins to benefit from the technology that we've built and kind of grow overall adoption of, of stable coins in the internet financial system. Got it. But fair to say no immediate plans for anything beyond that right now. Is that the thought I'm hearing from you? Yeah. So, uh, you know, Circle doesn't want to be the legal issuer of more currency stable coins right now. Got you. All right. Thank you so much. Let's take a look back in history a little bit, um, ahead to a time that was probably quite stressful for you in March 2023, which is when there was the DPEG of, of USDC to the dollar, really on the back of all the troubles, the banking troubles in the United States system with Silicon Valley Bank, etc. Uh, I can only imagine that was very stressful for you and stressful for the ecosystem overall. So I wanted to ask about the learnings from that time and how USDC is different now to what it was then. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, um, the, the backdrop, obviously, uh, 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 of that is a period of time when regulators were putting in place significant constraints on the banking system with respect to this industry, with specific edicts and orders starting in January of 2023, a wave of enforcement actions targeting uh, a huge number of companies uh, in the industry in the United States, putting the entire global market on kind of uh, in, in a in a heightened state of of concern, you had uh, effectively after FTX collapsed a kind of quasi run on Silvergate Bank as people became concerned about Silvergate. Uh, that ultimately led to their insolvency, uh, and and then you had kind of you know uh, other banks that um, were providing accounts to this industry, like Signature Bank, as as another example. Uh, that were being mismanaged uh, and themselves had, you know, kind of risk issues, uh, most of which were not crypto related. But you literally had over the course of a seven day period, you had uh, three banks fail, close or be seized by the government. It was totally unprecedented. Uh, and, you know, for, for a company like Circle, you know, we can't choose those the the the, the timing of that. Like, this this is what happens. And you know, I think is this impacted not just Circle, obviously, virtually every single company in this entire industry was debanked in a period of seven days. They had they lost their ability to access the dollar system, like literally. I don't know what happened to you guys. If you guys banked with some of these other players, it was just yeah, it was like literally like everyone was effectively debanked. So it's yeah. like this is like a. A very, very you know, ch challenging moment. Now, Circle had long, you know, prided ourselves on having multiple redundant banking partners, and you know, but th these were getting knocked off, you know, you know as 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 as, uh, as Dominus fell. But we were also fortunate that we had actually spent an enormous amount of time working with world class institutions like BlackRock and Bank of New York Mellon to stand up custodial infrastructure, as well as reserve management infrastructure in the form of the Circle Reserve Fund. And while certain banks were shut down or seized and like bank settlement stopped over the weekend, which led to secondary market price dislocations, 
we never once did not redeem or, or meant to redeem at a dollar. We, we never once. So we've never failed uh, to, to, to offer our product on a one for one basis. But the flip side is that, you know, on the other side of that weekend, we were, we were able to stand up infrastructure incredibly fast uh, in the United States with multiple banks, including global systemically important banks. And we were able to scale out the circle reserve fund infrastructure, which leads us to where we are today, which is it's an incredible infrastructure where we've evolved to. The 90% of USDC reserves are, um, are, are held in the circle reserve fund, which is an SEC registered and supervised uh, what's called government money fund um, structure. It is issued and managed by BlackRock, which is the largest asset manager in the world. They have some of the deepest liquidity management on these instruments in the world. They manage cash for, you know, central banks, like literally. And, um, and that circle reserve fund, if you search for USDXX, you can actually see on a daily basis, every single instrument that is there, every T-bill, its maturity, every, uh, every reverse repo, treasury collateralized reverse repo with GSIBs, you can see all of it. And so you can see exactly what's there. There's nothing that comes close to it in the industry, nothing that comes close to that level of safety and transparency. And then the 10% held in cash is almost entirely held in several global systemically important banks as cash. So we now have by far the safest, the most transparent digital dollar product in the world by far. And then on top of that, we've built out a, 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 a globalized infrastructure where we've stood up um, top, you know, uh, with top quality banks and regional fintech banks, uh, the ability to create and redeem USDC in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Brazil, in the EU, and bringing it into more markets. And so we have essentially regionalized the banking infrastructure. So companies and institutions that bank in any of those markets have direct settlement pipes into Circle and the, and the USDC environment. So we have this you know, very, I think, high quality reserve infrastructure, best in class, best in the world, big four auditor, big four accounting firm attest to it. People say you can't get a big four auditor. That's total BS. Like we've had a big four auditor for years. Now. We, we, uh, I have to say we haven't been able to get it. We've asked all four and all four have said no to, to Valor, but that's, that's so great we, we've had it for years it's working for and, some. and, uh, and, and, you know, so we, we have this kind of assurance on it and safety on it. And so I think, um, you know, we've, in, we've invested massively over the next year in building out that infrastructure to be best in class in the world. The, How the many most, banking the, partners do you have now? Do you have that? We have, we have quite here? a few. Um, I don't know the exact number, um, but uh, I would, I would say, uh, you know, you know, I, I, again, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's a significant number now. Yeah. I want to be respectful of your time. Last question I have for you, uh, Jeremy, before you leave is what is the biggest danger you see to, to the stablecoin industry and particularly to, to, to USDC and circle? Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think about the dangers per se. I mean, I, I think, um, um, look, we're in a, we're in a really important period where, um, as this becomes a more mainstream technology, as we get legal and regulatory clarity everywhere in the world, as the technology becomes usable to everyday users, like we're in a really powerful moment right now. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic about where we are. I think there's areas to kind of screw it up, you know, definitely, right? Uh, I think, um, you know, I think w one area is a lot of the, the, the regulators that are kind of finally coming into this space, um, you know, which we welcome because it, it kind of helps get us to a kind of different level of, of mainstream adoption, I think are still getting their arms wrapped around, you know, how do you rely on a public internet infrastructure? How do you rely on a public blockchain infrastructure as the basis for financial transactions? And so, you know, I, I get concerned that, you know, uh, you know, re regulators will sort of kind of we, we like this technology, but we, we don't like uh, an open internet version of it, right? And so I think that's a risk that's out there. But I think every day that goes by, every month that goes by, and the, the more and more usage and scale that we have, society kind of votes in the end. 
uh, for what's the most useful thing and, and useful technology. And I think in this case, society is definitely going to vote for stable coins. Absolutely. Good. That's great to hear. I've been looking at this halo behind your head. I don't know if you <laughs> place that uh, specifically for your calls, but it's great. It's, it's been wonderful to have you, Jeremy. Thank you very much for your time Thank and you best of luck with the business. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you.